Welcome to Speaking of Higher Ed, conversations on teaching and learning. I'm Andrew Everett. This podcast is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. This is episode 21. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share this podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Gary Green. Dr. Green is Professor of Natural Resources, Recreation, and Tourism Management at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia. Dr. Green, thanks for being our guest today. If you'll take a moment and please uh, briefly share with us the path that led you to your current role. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here today, and thank you for inviting me. So I should be very transparent and say I never wanted to be a teacher. I didn't. I wanted to be a researcher. And I had about a week left in my doctorate at the University of Georgia, uh, again, focusing on research. I always intended to go back to England to be a consultant. And my professor got stuck in Brazil. He called me at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, I need you to teach my three-hour class at 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. the following day. He sent me his PowerPoints. He sent me his notes. And I went into the room and I taught a class for three hours and then the students left and I promptly threw up in a trash can. And the reason I did that was because I realized that I was very excited. It was nerves, but it's also I really enjoyed myself. Two days later, my professor came back and I said, I think I want to teach. And he said, you want to be a researcher? I said, so did I, I thought that way. But now I think I want to teach. So I stayed an extra year to finish my doctorate and ended up teaching multiple classes for him. And really, that's what got me hooked in teaching. Uh, sheer dumb luck, to be honest. Wow. Well, that, that's a unique story. And uh, we're glad you did because you've got some unique perspectives to share with us um, on the student engagement. And so that is our topic for today, innovative strategies for student engagement. My first question, Dr. Green, is could you summarize your overall teaching philosophy and how it guides your approach to engaging students? So I realized several years ago that we don't really teach. We have no control whether students listen or learn. They can sit in front of you, but it doesn't mean they're going to listen. It doesn't mean they're going to take note. And with today's technology, I realized that students can have access to more information with a swipe of their finger than I can give them in a class. So then it comes to, well, how can I engage them? How can I want them to learn? And how can I help facilitate their learning? So my philosophy really is more one of helping them to realize why something is interesting, how it impacts them, why they should know about it, and to facilitate their learning by providing examples or providing real world examples that relate to them. So I see myself more as a facilitator of learning than actually a teacher. What are your most effective pre-class strategies for setting a positive tone and engaging students before they even come into the classroom? So I'm in the Warner School of Forestry, and actually that is four, four buildings. And so often the first day of class, a student will text me or call me and say, I'm in the classroom, no one's there. And I'm like, well, you're in the right number, but you're in the wrong building. So what I started to do, and I started this many years ago, is I will all email the entire class before the class starts. I will attach the syllabus and ask them to review the syllabus. I will give them my phone number if they should need to use it on the day. And I will give them directions to the right building in the right classroom. I will also ask them, is there anything on the syllabus that they think is either daunting to them or do they have any concerns about being able to do this class successfully? I introduce myself. I actually send a picture of myself. So the picture of myself. I actually send a picture of myself and my family. Uh, so they get to know a little bit about me. And then I say, I'm looking forward to seeing them on the first day of class. I also ask them, is there any reason why they may be late on the first day? And if so, how long do you think they're going to be late? Because sometimes people come from the far side of campus, which is like being on the far side of the universe for some students. And hence, I allow them time to get there. And so I know. Uh, I tell them a little bit of my interests and my hobbies. And I tell them why I'm teaching this class and particularly why this particular topic is passionate to me and ask them to actually email me before the class if they have any concerns or questions. What is their response to, to your approach to them, a very uh, friendly approach? So usually I'll get one or two people respond back, and then once I respond to them quickly, I find other people will respond back. Uh, many times students know other students that are going to be in the classes, and they'll say, well, I, I, you know, I emailed or I called Dr. Green, because and he responded to me. 
and they're kind of surprised by this. And so it's really by word of mouth that more students will contact me. And I typically do this about a week out and usually the day before. So they're going to get two emails from me before they even set foot in the class. And the fact that they know what I look like also helps a little bit. And the fact I share some of my hobbies and habits also helps. So the idea is to kind of break down the barriers of being a professor. And being British, people tend to think I'm more reserved anyhow. Uh, so we had this sort of aloof distance thing going for us as a Brit. Uh, and so I talk about that a little bit as well. So, but usually it works pretty well. Are there any ground rules? I know you, you share a photo of your family and you share your cell phone number. What ground rules do you put around, around that, that personal space? So I used to worry about giving students my phone number, but in 25 years of doing this, I've never had a student misuse it or abuse it. But typically I say to them, you know, you can call me anytime from eight in the morning to eight o'clock at night. All right? And the rule of thumb is this, if you email me, text me or call me, and I don't usually respond within about an hour, then you emailed, called or text the wrong person. Even if you text me saying you're having a great day, I will respond back to you saying good for you. I am one of these people, rare, but I am one of these people, when I go home at night, my email box is empty. I've always been that way. And so students know that if they reach out to me, I'll respond to them. One of the rules I do have is when I pass students, say I leave my office to go to a classroom or coming back, I say, oh, Dr. Green, about this exam or about this paper. And I always say to them, pull it into an email. It doesn't exist until you put it in an email. Because between me going to my class and coming back, I could have anywhere from five or 10 students tell me different things. And then if I don't respond, they start thinking, well, did I ask him? Did not like what I asked him? Did I ask him the wrong thing? Is he upset with me? And it, this starts a spiral. So just to save that miscommunication or the a chance for miscommunication, I just say to them, pull in an email. If you pull in an email, I will always respond to you. And then you know that I listened to what you said and I've responded to it. It's a great tip. And you talk about, we talked about um, before class starts, let's talk about the first day of class. What specific activities are you incorporating on the first day of class to build the rapport with students and set clear expectations? So I'm a great believer, even in a class of 400 or 300 or a class of 16, when I walk in the first day, the first thing I say is, hello. And about, if I'm lucky, maybe 10 students will say hello back. And so I'll stop. I'll say, well, I thought I said that out loud, but maybe I didn't. Hello. And then maybe about 30 students will say hello back. I say, oh, obviously I'm not saying it loud enough. And I'll say it again. And I'll keep saying it until the vast majority of people say hello, at which point they're scre screaming at me, hello. And my whole point is to say to them, well, thank you. That wasn't too hard. I'm actually trying to inform that when I talk, I want them to listen. And when they talk, I will listen. And when I talk, I expect an answer. So I say to them, you can sit at the back of this class or you can sit at the front of the class. It will make no difference. I will ask you questions. I will rove around the class and I want to engage you. So when I ask you something, I expect you to respond. Right? And when you say something, I will respond. So that's the first thing is setting the tone of expectations. Students, I've asked students, why is it they don't respond? And often they say to me, well, we've been taught to be invisible. A professor will ask a question, nobody answers. Then they answer their own question. Or a professor comes in and says hello, five people say hello, and the rest of us say nothing. So we've learned to be invisible because professors let us be invisible. So the first rule is you don't get to be invisible. So that's important. And then I actually give out a bio sheet. So it asks things like preferred name, nickname, movies you like, quotes you like, why are you take in this class? Is there any particular subject that you'd like to cover in this class that may not be in the syllabus or is on the syllabus? A bit about their background, favorite music, etc. Now I used to just give that to them and then they would fit it out and turn it in for one bonus point because I got to know a bit about them. And then I started actually filling out the same document but for myself. So now I ask them to fill out the bio sheet and then when they hand me their bio sheet, I actually hand them their mine. And what I found is 
sometimes students like the same books I like, or they like the same music, which is kind of strange, but I have young children. So my children are 14 and 13, they like a lot of the music that the students here like. So we're talking about music, we're talking about books, we're talking about movies, we're talking about favorite candy bar, which in my case is a Snickers. And so instantly we're finding these points of mutual interest that we can talk about. The other thing I do is, is if there's a particular topic I'm covering and say three or four students have said, I really like this topic, at the bottom of the slide, I will say, and Andrew, Michelle, John, and Elizabeth, this should be attention to you because you mentioned in your bios that you like this. And sometimes during exams, what I'll do is I'll take one song from everybody and make a playlist. And during exams, I'll say to them, I'm going to play music. This is music from your favorite music. Everyone here will have one song that they liked. This is to relax you during an exam. So if you're going to take a bio sheet, you've got to use the information from the bio sheet to show that you're actually listening and caring. The last question is always, is there any reason why you would not succeed well in this class? Or is there anything about you that I need to know? And again, sometimes students will say, well, I'm scared of public speaking. And I've made exceptions before where I've had students stay after class and just present to me one-on-one. -on -one initially until they've got that confidence. There's always an opportunity for them to tell me something about themselves where they have a fear or they have an apprehension. And then my job is then to, how do I accommodate that? Or how do I help them with that? I know that you also use a variety of interactive um, tools. I, I know you throw paper balls, yes. uh, uh, you use multimedia elements, you use a lot of things, you, you, you'll throw candy. Um, how do these methods, how, how do you think they impact student engagement and and ultimately their uh, learning outcomes. Right. So one of the things I do is this discussion. Is it's based upon discussion. So some students don't want to speak up. And so one of the things, I was going to class one day and it happened to be snowing. I happened to just see a, uh, a snowball fight. And I got to class, who was having this discussion, and it suddenly occurred to me, everyone take out a piece of paper. Just take out a plain piece of paper. Right. Write your name on top of it. Right. What are three things you just got from this discussion? What are three things that you think are important, three things you have questions about, just three things that you think is worth sharing? And then screw that up into a ball. You can always tell the anal students because they start folding it. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> screw it up into a ball. And the first time I did this, I made a mistake. I said, okay, now throw it to anybody in the room. And there happened to be about 239 students in this room at the time on North Campus. And everyone threw it at me. So I learned the rule very early. You can throw it to anybody, but don't throw it at me. So then I had to basically pass all these balls back out to people. Then I said, I'll open it up. Read it. Do you have the same opinions? Do you have different things to say? Write down three things that you think. So again, they do it. And then they throw it again. So this happens four times. At the end of it, you have a piece of paper in front of you that usually is not yours. So I can point to any student and say, read one thing off your list. They then read it from that list. And then we have a discussion. I was at the beach with my kids and I saw people playing with a beach ball. And it suddenly occurred to me, huh. So I bought three beach balls to class. Um, I tried blowing them up, I almost had an asthma attack, but I actually gave it to students to do. And then I put post-its on it. I stuck post-its on these balls. And I hit them into the audience. Same activity, write three things on the ball, hit it to somebody else. And again, they could catch a ball and they could read something off the ball, it's not them. Since that time, I've used aeroplanes, I've used those fortune cooker things, and the students like it. Now, how do I, has it helped the students? Because part of their greatest discussion, at the end of it, they all pass me, there is the aeroplanes or the beach balls, and I keep all the notes, because it has the students' names on it. And everyone that participated has their name on a sheet, and I make a note of that. The other thing that I'll do is I'll do what's called a, a lab in a bag. So I'll give students a big Ziploc bag and there'll be a little whiteboard in it and there'll be some marker pens and typically there'll be a name. So let's just say I look at natural resources. So we have these famous you know, preservationists, conservationists, so like John Muir, um, et cetera, uh, Gifford Pinchot, and there'll be a name in that bag. So students get into a group and their job is they can use their phones, they can use their laptops, I want them to write five things on that board that they think was significant about this person. Why should we care that this person existed? What did they do that was very important? So they write it on the board. Then there's a spokesperson for that group. 
and they get up and will read off their board. Now I have my notes thinking what I think is important. So after they do that, I take a picture of the board and I will add any supplementary comments I think is important. Now those pictures then get put into our sort of web-based ELC, which students have access to. Okay. And again, I know the students in the group because they give me their names. On one of the exams, there'll be a question like, talk about one of the pioneering conservationists or preservationists in your field. Well, as a group, they've already dealt with one person. So they should be able to answer that question. All right. The other thing I do is, is I, like, I like Wordle. My entire family plays Wordle. We do it every morning. I do it with my friends in Australia, New Zealand. We all play the same Wordle. And I was trying to think about how do I get students to study you know, certain concepts because it's hard to get them to do that. So one day I came to class and I'd been actually just finishing my Wordle and I thought, I'm going to create Learndle. So instead of Wordle, I'll call it Learndle. So it's the same rules. It's, you know, I have five letter word, six goes. And I came in and said, okay, fun activity. First person to guess this, I'll buy lunch. This is a term that we used in the previous lecture. Give me a letter to start with. So give me a word, and I'll put a square, green square, the ones where the letter's in the right, red, it means it's wrong, and yellow means it's the right letter, but in the wrong space. And then they've got six goes to try and get it. And, you know, recently I was teaching a class about interpretation, and one of the key things about interpretation is having a theme. So the word was theme. And a student got it, and I took him out to lunch. Now when I come in and I put it on the board, which I do with most lectures, I start with that. As I walk in the room, students are already opening their books and scanning the last lecture, trying to figure out what the five letter keyword is going to be. And in that process, they're looking at their notes, but I'm not asking them to do it. And when I forget to do it, they really get upset. And go, well, what happened to learn all today? Why are we not doing it today? The other thing I try to do is, is fun. So I bring blow pops. And people say, well, why do you bring blow pops? Because I have a simple rule. If you ask a question, you have to get the blow pop. The blow pop has to go in your mouth. So in a big class, there are students sitting there with little white sticks sticking out. So I know who's asked the question. So I can always go to somewhere else. Now sometimes a student will be you know, very vigilant and ask another question. Well, the rule still applies. So now they have two blow pops, which means they have to put them both in their mouths, which now there's two white sticks. I did once have a student that managed to get four blow pops in their mouth and were still trying to get them out to ask other questions, which was quite funny. So it's better than saying the students don't talk up just by giving them a blow pop. So I'm rewarding them and I'm slowing them down from trying to dominate all the questions. So these are things that I do, which I think are simple. Uh, I also do something called the magic hat, where for an exam review, I'll take 30 questions, and there will be hard, middle, medium, and easy, and the 30 questions will go into a hat. And I'll say to a student, okay, pick out a question from the hat. And it's an exam question. And they can answer that question, right? or they can put it back in and take a different question, or they could ask for someone to help them and they can get a question. Well, the students quickly realize they can game the system so everyone gets one question right. And it's worth one bonus point if you get it right. So it's not a lot, but again, it starts making them work in pairs, they look at their notes, and it's just an easy way to do it. So again, these aren't difficult things, they're sort of simple things, uh, but engaging students, and in many ways they learn by me not telling them to learn, but by doing the activity. Are there some of these strategies that you think um, work best in small classes, large classes? Um, so, thank you. So the, the things like the aeroplanes and the balls actually work better in big classes. Uh, the lab in the bag tends to work better in the sort of medium to small, although I've done it in a room of 200, you just got to have 10 bags. So it, it depends. And again, these things sit in my office, so they're there to go. Uh, generally on the smaller ones, I try to do the things where students can engage multiple times. So, the, so one of the things I'll say to students is, in a smaller class, I'll say, well, everyone write one exam question and give it to me. All right? And they have their names on it. 
and then I will put them in a hat, I'll mix them up, and I'll put it out and say, okay, here's an exam question, and, and so like, Trisha, you wrote this, you can't answer it. Who can answer this? Right. And again, it's a gaming system where they try to figure out how to do it. Now, what the, the catch for that is, is at the end of it, I'll ask them, of all those questions I asked you, what are two or three questions that you thought were good questions for this next exam? And generally they can come to a sort of a consensus about these were the three questions that we thought were really good. And those three questions will then be in the exam. So it's an exam review that it's worth doing because they know those questions will be in the exam. Same as when I go into a room, I always have an exam review. I'll have the exam physically in my hand and I'll go through the exam and ask different questions for the exam review. And I'll tell them the format because part of that is just reducing that stress. So there's so many true false, so many multiple choice. There's one thing I know I can take away as not knowing is by providing the formats. That's one thing they know. Right? I used to really dislike it when a professor would come in and do an exam review and then you'd study it and not a single thing would be on the exam review that was on the exam. So by physically having the exam in my hand, I'm telling them this is genuine. This is the exam review. Here's the exam. So sometimes the smaller engaging things or where I change things or get the students to speak more, which is harder than in a big group. And how are you collecting uh, and using student feedback during the semester to improve your teaching? They're learning these strategies. So one of the things I do is, is just right before midterm, I'll put out plain sheets of paper on the desk. This is at the end of the class, and I'll just say to them, write down three things that you think you really enjoyed about this class, and why did you enjoy it? What did you learn? What are one or two things that you didn't really understand? And, and why? Uh, and what is one thing you haven't got to that you'd like to get to? And then I leave the room. And normally I'll have one of the students just take with the sheets, there's no names on it, take the sheets and bring them to me. Now one of the things I've learned is, is if you're gonna ask for feedback, then you have to let them know that you're responding to feedback. So that means uh, next lecture I might go in and say, you know, majority of you really struggled with this concept. So we're gonna spend some time going back over that concept, right? Or majority of you felt like this wasn't explained more fully or you needed more examples. So let's go through more examples. And sometimes I typically leave one or two lectures where it's to be decided in a syllabus and it's towards the end of the semester. And I'll say to them, a lot of you have showed an interest in, shall we say, exotic you know, animals or invasive species um, or pollution or heat pollution or light pollution. So this lecture will be on that topic. So now they know they've got a choice. Their choices have actually resulted in me creating a lecture for that topic. The biggest thing is I always want them to know that I've read their feedback and then I'm acting on it. So when I change anything in the future, I always try to say, this is based upon the feedback that you gave me right before midterms. So I'll do it right before midterms, and then usually the, in the middle between midterms and finals, I'll do the same thing again. So it's twice during the semester, they will get to provide me feedback, and then I actively let them know that I heard your feedback, this is what I did, and this is how I responded. So they feel they have a voice. What What are the um, What are some of the things they that you're hearing that they really l like? Are there certain? I mean, Learndal. I imagine if you're buying someone lunch, that's probably pretty popular. Yeah. yeah. So they like Learndal a lot. Um, they really like seeing my bio sheet and comparing it to theirs and and talking about that. That's that's engaging for them. They do like the fact that we have this idea of uh, the magic hat where they get to play a game, which is type of a exam review. They've told me that. And I've actually simulated the same class where I've taught the same class one semester as the next semester and done some of these activities and versus not done as many. And the class where I did the more activities, the, the grade was up by about an average of half a grade higher for the entire class. There's also the point where they know that I have a certain sense of humor. So one of the bonus questions is, give me the title of your book. Well, the question says, for this class named XYZ, give me the book title. And people will write, well, it has a polar bear on it, or it's blue, etc. And then usually about one third of the class might get it right. And then I'll say to them, well, 
you understand that the title of the book is the title of the class, which I put in the question. And they will look at me and go, oh. And then when I give an exam, say I give an exam that's say like 50 questions, in the exam, it's part of this sort of a mystery. There are five answers in the exam to five other questions in the exam. So a multiple choice might contain an answer to a true false, or a multiple choice might contain an answer to a short answer. And so there are five different questions that provide five different answers in the exam. And I actually say to them, if you can figure out where they are and you circle them, then I would take basically, uh, we get funds from the University of Georgia where we can take students out uh, for lunch or for a social event. And so I say, you know, w if you can find them, circle them, then we'll go out to lunch. And so I use those funds to engage the students. It's interesting how the students will stay to the very end, scouring that exam to try to find the five things they can circle them just so they could go out to lunch. And what it makes them do though is check the exam. Because how often have people go for an exam, they skip a question because it's too hard, then they're finished and they come and give it to me and leave. And then they realize, oh, I missed a question. And then they can't come back. So by telling them if they circle the five questions, they give them answers somewhere else, they actually skirt for the exam. And if they miss something, they get it. And so that's an activity that they really enjoy. The other thing I try to do is, you know, you present and I get tired of my voice, to be fair. And so occasionally I'll just say to a student, here's a quote, please read it. And so they know I'm gonna ask them to do different things, which is fun. When I provide examples, I always ask them to give examples. And when I do that, I tend to sit down on the edge of a desk so I'm no longer standing up. So really they're kind of talking to each other. One of the activities I did actually this time last year was in my interpretation class. It's about interpreting. So you have adjects, objects, you can interpret, etc. And one of the skill sets is, is to practice this. So it was Halloween. So I came into class and said, okay, get into groups of three. I want each group to come up with a themed Halloween short talk, four to five minutes, and you will all judge yourselves and decide who gave the best talk about a Halloween. And it can be about anything you want, but it has to be a Halloween theme. So they chose, you know, old nursery things, they chose mystery stories, they chose haunted houses, jack-o'-lanterns, and some of them did phenomenally really good talks. And it actually came down to two students, then it was split. So I ended up taking both groups out for a cup of coffee. But that sort of fun element of changing things up uh, and it was, you know, it was that time in the semester where people were tired, it's a long weekend, and so I just said, okay, you need to practice this skill, so you can use your laptops, you can use your phones, come up with a theme about something to do with Halloween. So I think part of it is looking at your audience, understanding that not all days are equal, understanding that everyone can have a bad day, it's okay, and trying to do things that are simple, just, it doesn't have to be a lot of work to teach and to do something innovative. In fact, most of the times it can be really simple. A couple of years ago I came in and it was the whole lecture was about key people. So I gave them a word search and then the names of the key people were in that word search. So as they're given the lecture, they had, to, they had to circle the names of the different people and then hand it in at the end, which just reinforced again the names as I'm saying them, it making them active. I've done crosswords before where the crossword answers are key concepts from the class that I'm teaching. So again, it's how do you find ways to engage them that are fun and are easy to do. At what point in your teaching career did you say, hey, there's an engagement problem and, and you got creative and started incorporating these strategies? So I used to teach a class at eight o'clock in the morning in winter. And nobody wants to do a class at eight o'clock in the morning in winter. And there was this young man that actually came in every day and bless him, he would sit in the very front row and promptly fall asleep. And I thought, well, there's gotta be a way to engage him. So I kept trying to engage him. And at one point I even said to him, you know, are you allergic to any way to coffee? He said, no. So I started bringing him a cup of coffee as well as myself. And then about three quarters away from the class, I just realized he kept falling asleep. And I said to him, I don't know what else I can do. And he actually turned around and said to me, I have a sleeping disorder, I can't stop myself. And I thought, well, thank you for sitting in the front row. I do appreciate that. And so then I started thinking of different ways to engage him. It was really aimed at him. 
And I found that these strategies of doing things that involve people actually kept them awake. And so it started with that. And then the other thing was realizing that even my own attention span isn't as long as it used to be. And you know, I go to these guest lectures where I sit there and listen to these seminars by different people coming in. And I found myself nodding off. And I thought, well, if I'm doing this with you know, preeminent scholars that are coming in, then maybe I need to rethink about what I'm doing for my students. And I realized that, yes, the material is important. Yes, you should take it seriously. But if you're not engaging them, then they're not learning anyhow. And if it isn't fun for you, then it isn't fun for them. And learning should be, we call it edutainment. You're entertaining and you're educating at the same time. A good friend of mine uh, actually coined that phrase. It wasn't me, but he called it edutainment. And so I believe these days what I do is edutainment. And, and it's working. And yep. I know that you also incorporate personalized letters and other recognition strategies, acknowledging your students. How does that impact student motivation and participation in your courses? There was a young man, actually it was a young man and a young woman, uh, both of them, this was several years ago, and they tried really hard, um, but they were sort of solid C minus, C plus students. And they come to every lecture, they took notes, and they tried really hard, and I could see they were just struggling. And even with additional help, they were still struggling. And you know, students get 100% an exam, or they get a really good paper, or they do a really good presentation. And I just felt that there has to be some way to motivate or recognize that these people are doing the best that they can. Not everyone is an A student in all classes. You know? So they might have been A students in other classes. It's just in this class, they obviously were struggling a little bit. So I came up with the idea and I created a letter and it basically just says, and I might get this wrong, but at the top of my head it says, it is a privilege and honor to teach at the University of Georgia. What makes this a privilege is teaching students that have the following traits. They always come to class, they ask questions, they're engaged, they do good essays, they do good presentations, they do well in exams. Right? You have multiple of these traits and so I want to recognize you for the work you've done in this class. And I want to basically praise you for what you've done and to tell you to keep doing it. It's making a difference and I'm noticing you. Right? And again, it's an honor and privilege to teach this class because I have students in it like you. And I sign it and I get my dean to sign it. And in a class of 100, after the first main assignment or activity, I will give out four of these. And one will go to the person that got the highest score one will go to the best presentation, but two will go to the students that just try. And they will kind of, I give it to them, and I don't say anything, this is for you, it's in a sealed envelope, it's official, it's on official letterhead. And they'll look at it, and instantly they think something's gone wrong, because they don't want to open it, and then they'll slowly open it, then they'll take it out, and then they'll look at it and read it, and then they'll show their friends. And I've actually had students come to me and say, I, I framed that. I actually framed it, or I sent it home to my parents, or I took a copy and sent it to my parents. And I've had students say, well, I didn't get the best paper. I say, yeah, but you hear every day, you try every day, you ask good questions, your effort is something you should be proud of. And so it actually addresses a range of skills, but it also recognizes those people that just continually try, and those that do better. And I've had students graduate, and years later come back to me and say, I never thought I could pass the class, and I got the letter, and I was determined to show you I could pass the class. How does that make you feel when you hear oh, I get this feedback? Sometimes. Yeah, um, it's strange. It's, uh, I've had students before um, come back and tell me this, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. I once had a student 18 years after they graduated uh, called me and said, it actually got a job as a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone and said, I've, I've got my dream job and it all started with a class from you. And I just wanted to thank you. And, there, and I got choked up actually listening to it. I just, you know, it's, 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 you don't realize the impact you have or the impact you could have just by being a little bit empathetic and just by recognizing that uh, everyone's different and embracing that, those differences. That's fantastic. And as we wrap up, I want to ask our continuing the conversation question, which is what advice would you give other educators who are looking to enhance student engagement and create a dynamic classroom environment? So I would say be yourself. 
be genuine, use a conversational tone, because people like a conversational tone, smile, say people's names. If you're not good at remembering names, use tense. I actually use name tense for my students and I give a prize for the name that's actually, the, for the name tent that's best decorated, you know. And so I think that, keep things simple, you know. People try to think of all these elaborate things to engage students. One of the simplest ideas I ever had was I was going to class and I realized that I hadn't had lunch. So I stopped at a creamery, a little calf, and I got a tuna sandwich, I got an orange juice, I got a banana, uh, and I got a box of Tic Tacs, and then I got, I think, what else did I get? I think I got like a pack of chips, crisps. And I just put it on the podium and I started teaching and a young lady at the front said, so, so what's in the bag? And one of the things on my portfolio or my, my bio, it says that I like Scooby-Doo. And you know, my dad likes Scooby-Doo. I remember watching Scooby-Doo with my dad. I like Scooby-Doo. My kids watch Scooby-Doo with me. And so I said, oh, well, you know, you know I like Scooby-Doo. This is a mystery bag. And I thought it on the spur of the moment. I wrote mystery bag on it. Well, then the student says, well, what happens? I said, well, when you ask a good question, you get to take anything from the bag and keep it. So she tried and tried, and eventually she asked the question. I said, that is worthy of the bag. So I held the bag up. She reached in, and she pulled out the tuna sandwich. And she said, it's a tuna sandwich. And I said, yes, and it's yours. She goes, but it's a tuna sandwich. Again, it is yours. And then everyone started putting their hands up, wanting to put their hand in the bag. Well, I forgot about this. And then students started saying, when's the mystery bag coming back? So I was leaving my house one day and my kids were donating toys. So I picked up a handful of toys, threw them in a bag. Mystery bag comes back. The second question, this, a young man came up and he pulled out a mini me, a minion. And he said, I've got a minion. Everyone's hands started going up. Or well, it happened to be that a young student came down and put her hand in the bag and she pulled out a rubber snake. At which point I made a note to myself, do not put rubber snakes in a bag because she promptly fainted. And I had to catch her before she hit the ground. So I know, don't put rubber spiders in there, don't put rubber snakes. The whole point of that is, in my evaluation, she actually wrote, Dr. Green's the best professor I've ever had, only one to make me faint, and which my dean was like, I don't understand this till I kind of explained what happened. So the whole point is, is keep it simple. I do simple really well. And if anything about my teaching I'm proud of is, I do simple really well. Don't make it onerous on you. If it's hard for you, it's hard for them. Think of simple things, right? and just do the simple things, and have fun. And sometimes you're gonna get it wrong. I have done things before that have fallen flat on their face, and I said to the class, today I sucked. It wasn't a good day for me, which means it wasn't a good day for you. So we're gonna redo this lecture at a later point, and I'm gonna change things up. So don't worry about this being on exam. This time, it'll be on exam later. So just have a certain humility that you will have good days and bad days, and so will they. A little bit of empathy goes a long way. So my biggest advice is be humble, right? be empathetic, and just be yourself, just be genuine. Is there anything I didn't ask that you, you wanted to, to share about this, this topic? I think that we try too hard to make things more complex because if it's important, it needs to be complex. And I don't think it does. I think having empathy and understanding that people do have good days and bad days and just being reasonable about that. I found that students will approach me and tell me things because they know I'm willing to listen. So I think that's a big thing. Office hours are good for professors. If you really want to engage students, get to in class early and leave class late, and that's when they're going to find you. And try to engage students outside the classroom. The only time that you're engaging them is when they come into your office or when you're during the class, then really you don't care. So what students will say to me is, you often say hello and you pass me by, or you see me in the corridor. And I do, because I generally like them. So, but I think the biggest thing is have fun, enjoy what you're doing, and try different things. And some will work and some won't, but the fact that you're trying does make a difference. Well, thank you, Dr. Green, for this, this great conversation. Uh, how can listeners connect with you if they want to reach out? So my email, which is 
G, T, green. Gary Terrence, green, green like the color, no E on the end. GT green at uga.edu. So GT green at uga.edu. My cell number, which I give to my students, and I'm happy to give to you, is 706-296-3029. 706-296-3029. Fantastic. Thanks again for this. This has been a, a, a great education on these simple strategies and not, not overthinking it, just looking around, making everyday observations to come up with ways to engage students. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you for your time. It was an honor to do it and I hope it helps and have fun teaching. Keep it simple. The conversation continues on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash A-U-G-C-I-I. Please contribute your thoughts on today's topic and other episodes. You can find more on our show page at augusta.edu forward slash innovation. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share this podcast. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. Speaking of Higher Ed is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University.